This video is about the effects of wedges and studs on the distribution of pressure, the orientation of the distal bones and the process of placing the hoof. The data presented here were raised by a scientific cooperation between Werkmann and the Institute of Veterinary Anatomy Leipzig. Heel wedges and studs partially modify the horseshoe height in the dorsal palmar plane. For this study, six degree heel wedges were fastened to the branches tipped with tape. The results can be influenced by different lengths, heights and material of the wedges. The studs were screwed in halfway between the end of the fuller and the branches tips. Heel wedges are often used to relieve the deep digital flexor tendon during cases of acute illness or injuries to this structure. Another indication are illnesses of the podotrochlea, consisting of the navicular bone, navicular bursa and the onset of the deep digital flexor tendon. In cases of acute laminitis, wedges are often part of different versions of horseshoes which aim to minimise the tension of the deep digital flexor tendon and thus reduce further descent or rotation of the coffin bone. Sometimes heel wedges are used to adjust the long paston bone when the toe alignment is too flat. So, Heel wedges are therapeutically modified horseshoes. In contrast, studs are used to reduce the risk of slipping and to allow the horse to be used in its specific discipline, be that jumping, eventing or carriage sport. The effects of wedges and studs in relation to a standard horseshoe were examined by radiological and pressure measurements. The radiological examinations followed a standardised protocol and were carried out on a firm and soft x-ray block in order to simulate different types of ground. Two pressure measurement sensors were simultaneously fixed on the hoof and every examination was carried out on four different types of ground. You will find detailed information on methods and the execution of kinetodynamic examinations in earlier lectures on this homepage. The alignment of the coffin bone in the dorsal palmar plane is severely influenced by heel wedges. The barefoot situation as well as the usage of standard horseshoes serve as a comparison. Every radiographic examination was carried out on a firm wooden block and a block with soft padding. On firm ground, the alignment of hoof and coffin bone is steeper and was to be expected. When sinking into the ground as possible, we see that the palmar angle of the coffin bone increases considerably too, in comparison to the barefoot situation or a standard shoe. So, the coffin bone's alignment becomes steeper on both examined types of ground. The following images illustrate this. Based on the biomechanical results of other research groups like Denoir et al, a palmar raise together with a steeper alignment of the coffin bone causes the upper digital bones to descend and the paston joints to extend further. So the positive effect of the steeper coffin bone angle is the relief it offers to the deep digital flexor tendon and the podotrochlear region. Simultaneously, it is assumed that the descent of short and long pastern bone increases the stress on the supersensory ligaments as well as the superior digital flexor tendon and the sesamoidin ligaments. As you have just seen, the steeper alignment of the coffin bone influences the pastern joint angle and thus the stress on the suspensory ligaments. This study could prove, however, that the descent of short and long pastern bone caused by a steeper alignment of the coffin bone seems to be dependent on the horse's toe conformation. In horses with a club foot, this effect is very apparent. The palmar angle becomes steeper, the short pastern bone descends. In horses with a very flat toe alignment, the opposite effect is detectable. Considerable individual variations concerning the alignment of the short pastern bone could be observed in every horse. In addition, radiographic examinations can only ever be a static snapshot. Radiographic videography showed that the expected effects during the main stance phase could only be provoked when using heavily exaggerated heel or toe wedges. Therapeutically used heel wedges show no significant influence on the paston joint angle in these examinations too. On firm ground, studs and wedges have the same effect on the toe axis, 
the coffin bone's alignment becomes steeper. On soft ground, however, the studs penetrate the ground far more easily so that the palmar angle is considerably smaller than on firm ground. This effect is intensified by increasing forces during motion. Now we explain the influence of wedges and studs on the mediolateral orientation of the coffin bone in relation to the ground. The same references, as mentioned before, serve as a comparison. Every radiographic examination was carried out on a firm wooden block and a block with soft padding. On firm ground, wedges and studs have no influence on the mediolateral orientation of the coffin bone. On soft ground, there are generally differences regarding the mediolateral orientation of the coffin bone in comparison to firm ground. On soft ground, the, according to the build, heavily loaded part of the hoof can sink in, causing the angle of the coffin bone in relation to the ground to change. With horseshoe modifications, which make it easier for the posterior part of the hoof to sink into the ground, this effect tends to be less prominent. The following images illustrate this. The steeper alignment puts the limb into a much better position to unroll. The dorsal lever arm is shorter, making the process of unrollment easier so that the deep digital flexor tendon has to contribute less tension. Every horseshoe influences the way the pressure forces are distributed across the hoof capsule apart from their effects on bones, tendons and ligaments. Here we demonstrate what kind of ground reaction forces develop between shoe and ground and how they are relayed to the hoof capsule. First we look at those pressure forces which develop between shoe and firm ground during walking. The pressure distribution pattern of heel wedges shows that the toe and the raised branches tips are heavily loaded while the centre part of the branches is entirely relieved of pressure. But how does the shape of the shoe and the resulting pressure distribution pattern influence the hoof capsule? Here we can see that the pressure is passed on from the shoe to the hoof on firm ground. Toe and heels are under significantly more stress and pressure peaks are visible. The lateral walls, however, are subject to less pressure force. Looking at the pressure distribution patterns in deep sand while walking, the following becomes apparent. The toe and the branches tips are loaded heavier. This is directly passed on to the hoof capsule. On soft ground, the toe and the heels are subject to more stress too, and pressure peaks are visible. The centre of the hoof is under less stress than it would be with a standard shoe. Studs show a similar influence on the pressure distribution pattern. On firm ground, the shoe's toe and the studs become clearly visible. The branch's middle sections hover and aren't loaded. As with wedges, the hoof's toe is loaded heavily too, and there are pressure peaks underneath the studs. The studs sink easily into soft ground, and the posterior part of the hoof is under less stress, but we can see pressure peaks underneath the toe and the studs on the soft ground. Heavily loading the heels over a long period of time can have undesirable side effects. In cases of unstable heels, the bulbs and the coronal band can become compressed, restricting the hoof cartilage. Sheared heels, askew bulbs or even horn fissures may follow. When treating acute cases of laminitis, wedges can lessen the tension of the deep digital flexor tendon, but the dermis is subjected to more stress because of the fibre orientation. Because the coffin bone suspensory apparatus, which consists of connective fibres, basal membrane, dermal laminae and horn laminae of the wall segment, is damaged by laminitis to a greater or lesser extent, the wedge's height and duration of application must be carefully evaluated for each individual case. In cases of chronic laminitis, the steeper alignment can cause additional stress on the anterior half of the hoof. This can cause horses which already have a descended or rotated coffin bone severe pain in the tiptoe region. In these cases, the application of horseshoes with palmar support and padding is advisable. Next, we look at the effects of wedges on the process of footing. 
The footing pattern is formed out of several steady steps which are averaged into one picture showing the migration of the centre of force during the main stance phase. The average picture shows the footing, the movement during the main stance phase, the unrollments and the point of breakover. Using heel wedges in comparison to a standard shoe leads to a more abrupt transition from footing to the main stance phase, as you can see in these three examples. In addition, there are slight instabilities during the footing phase. The introduction of studs leads to a more pronounced toe footing together with considerable mediolateral instability. Apart from that, you have to bear in mind that studs prevent slipping on soft ground, but at the same time fix the hoof to the ground by sinking in. This can be stressful to tendons and ligaments during turns. Summing up, the effect the application of wedges has on the toe bone alignment produces reproducible and consistent results concerning the position of the coffin bone. The palmar angle increases irrespective of the ground conditions. The conformation of the upper toe bones, however, shows significant individual variations in accordance with the horse's build. Looking at the effects on the pressure distribution pattern, we see that there are several pressure peaks underneath the heels and the toe which are irrespective of the ground conditions as well. Furthermore, unrollment is made easier by the wedge's steeper alignment, which relieves the deep digital flexor tendon, but there are instabilities during unrollment. As a rule, height, length and position of the wedges have to be adjusted to the individual case, and the side effects have to be taken into account when determining the duration of the application. Studs have a similar effect on the toe bone alignment. Only on soft ground, the steeper alignment is compensated because studs penetrate the ground more easily. The hoof capsule shows significant pressure peaks underneath the studs and partly the toe. In addition, the limb's steeper alignment makes unrollment easier. However, studs cause a more pronounced toe footing on firm ground and considerable mediolateral instability during footing. Considering the side effects, Screwed-in studs are preferable to welded-in studs as they can be used specifically for the work or sport event and can be removed afterwards. The usage of studs on firm ground should be as limited as possible. In order to limit the fixation of the limb during turns, the stud's position, shape and size can be adjusted. When using a shoe modification like this, the effects on tendons, ligaments, bones and cartilage or the modification of dynamic processes are at the centre of attention. Often the impact on the surrounding hoof capsule takes a back seat. By changing the pressure distribution and the supporting surface, we influence the sensitive blood circulation and the horn architecture significantly. On the whole, all the anatomic structures forming the distal extremity form a close regional and functional relationship. It is safe to assume that relief for one structure causes additional strain on the counterpart, so that the efficacy of a shoe modification has to be evaluated individually in every case. Many thanks to all our assistants and thank you very much for your attention.